Hey, folks. We're about five minutes away from our next panel, so I invite you to come on into the ballroom, grab a seat for this exciting next panel. We're about five minutes away from our next panel, so I invite you to come on in. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'll ask you to come on in and, and take your seats. Welcome back into the ballroom here at the National Press Club. Welcome to our studio audience. And welcome to those of you joining us online through our live stream. This next session is pure cooperative gold. Now over the next hour, we'll have a front row seat as this year's inductees share highlights, both good and not so good, from their cooperative lives. This in-depth conversation with these pillars of cooperation is a highlight for all of us in the cooperative community. I know I've been personally moved and inspired by their dedication and passion as they have built a life with cooperative or cooperation at its core. Now to get the conversation started, here's Doug O'Brien, President and CEO of NCBA Clusa. Hey Doug. Right. Thanks John. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, and thank you for those of us who are with us in person here at the National Press Club here in the nation's capital. And thank you to those who are joining us virtually in the 700 plus uh, registrants to the IMPACT conference and beyond uh, with the Cooperative Hall of Fame. It's great to be together. Um, this is my favorite moment in the cooperative year. Um, I got a great job. I got like a really, really great job. This is like my favorite thing about my job is, uh, is I get to be the guy who sits in this chair and listens to these folks. Uh, the Cooperative Hall of Fame, of course, is an institution within the cooperative community. Uh, that the Cooperative Development Foundation uh, is a, a, a caretaker for. Um, and every year they pick uh, four folks who are heroes in the cooperative community. Um, and this year uh, the, the, the ranks, the, the folks that, that are, are going to be inducted this evening are, are no exception. Um, and and I'm just looking forward to this conversation, to, to learning and to be inspired. Um, and I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, that's, that's mostly my job from here on out. So I, I first I'm going to ask the, the, the inductees a, a really hard question. Um, and that is just to tell us a little bit about their cooperative journey. Um, and I'm going to, I'll just, so, so you know who we're talking about here today. And we're going to start uh, with Clark Arrington uh, to my left. And Vern Dosh is with us. Uh, Andy Richter and Karen Zimmel. Uh, folks from across the cooperative sectors who have served in so many important ways. Uh, of course, on the, the uh, heroes.coop on the CDF website, there's a fantastic set of materials that go deep into their histories. Um, but we're going to hear from them uh, right from their mouths uh, right now. So Clark, we're going to start with you. Can you tell us a little bit about, about your cooperative journey? What brought you into the cooperative community? That is an interesting question. <laughs> um, and I, uh, 
I started writing, um, you know, sort of a, a speech, I guess, uh, um, and it, I, it's an amazing story, that's all I can say. And I'm sorry I'm not going to have time to really uh, go into it, but let's just say it started, I think, with SYNQ. And I'm not talking about the, uh, the boyfriend of Patty Hearst, but, um, but about the uh, African uh, who was enslaved and created a, a, a revolt on the ship La Amstead. And the long story short about that is that it ended up, the boat ended up in Connecticut, went to the US Supreme Court. Uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, who was uh, former president, uh, represented them at the Supreme Court level. The Supreme Court determined that they were free men. They didn't belong to uh, <clears throat> Spain, they didn't belong to Cuba, and they weren't slaves to be sold somewhere in South like Charleston. And so they were repatriated back to uh, Sierra Leone. And they raised money, of course, to do that. And with the surplus money, the excess money, they set up this college in Talladega, Alabama called Talladega College. And, uh, and that was in uh, 19, uh, no, it was in 1861, Talladega College was set up, black college, historically black college. Long story short here, my mother and father met at this college. My mother is from Boston, my daddy's from, from Cincinnati. So I, I can't kind of separate whether, you know, that had this guy not created this revolt on the boat, been repatriated, this college set up, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I could, I, so. That's where it starts. And, and what's brilliant about that story, I mean, it's, it's about my life, it's about collaboration, and I think that spirit has moved me. And um, to think that a slave or enslaved African and a former president coalesced and, and brought justice um, to, and, and the state of Connecticut, is kind of what I've been doing most of my life. And so from from SYNQ and from Talladega. Um, I can, you know, I won't go into too much more detail, but I ended up at the Federation of Southern Cooperatives at some point. I met John Zippert and Carol, who were members of the Hall of Fame, and they introduced me to cooperatives. I was a black capitalist, and they converted me to a cooperative person. <laughs> that, led me, <laughs> that led me to ICA, uh, Industrial Cooperative Association, which led me to Equal Exchange, um, which uh, inc incorporated uh, Cooperative Fund of New England. Um, which I'd been on their board for God knows how long, from like $100,000 to $40 million, um, to now the Cooperative Fund of the Northeast. Um, but from there, um, uh, Seed Commons, uh, uh, and, and that's where I'm at now, and I'm just gonna leave it there, and hopefully I'll have a chance to, to talk about Seed Commons and some of the other projects I'm involved in later. But thank you. Thank you, Clark. That's a great, that's a great start. Thanks, <laughs> All right, Vern, can you share your story? Thank you, Doug. So my story is a little different. When you think of cooperatives, you think of agricultural cooperatives or housing cooperatives or credit unions or worker cooperatives. But you probably don't hear about technology cooperatives very often. And that really was the bulk of my life, about 45 years working for a technology cooperative. And I, you know, I wish it was a, a very glamorous story. I started this in my garage and I, or in my dorm room, and you know, we went public and, and all that. <laughs> um, Someone else's story, huh? That wasn't the case. Um, we started very modestly based on a vision, and there's the old saying, necessity is the mother of invention. And at that time, in the 60s, 70s, there were about 1,000 rural electric cooperatives around the country, about 1,400 telephone cooperatives. They were building out plant. They were connecting consumers in rural America. But just about everything was done manually. Their accounting was done manually. Their engineering was done manually. And, um, and so the notion was, you know, if we're going to provide service at the lowest possible cost, whether it's electricity or telecommunication service, we need to begin to automate. We need to begin to embrace technology. And uh, how are we going to do that? 
you've got all these small co-ops around the country, mainframes cost a million dollars a piece, programmers were harder to get than they are today. And so the notion was, and, and you think about these individuals that started this technology cooperative to serve cooperatives, the notion was, well, if the IBMs and the digitals of the world will not work with us because we don't have the ability to have the technical spend that they think is worth their while, well, then I guess we're just going to have to do it ourselves. So it was that kind of attitude that really was the very beginning of NISC, where we said, look, we'll buy the mainframe, we'll develop the software from scratch, we'll move that software around to meet the needs of distribution co-ops, telephone co-ops around the country. And um, it really was, you know, we probably didn't understand how challenging and complex that would be. But we also didn't understand how impactful it would be. I mean, this started with a small co-op, small group of co-ops in North Dakota, went on to a small group of co-ops in St. Louis. And today, um, NISC within its membership counts about 870 co-ops around the country doing you know, electric co-ops, telecommunications co-ops, broadband co-ops. And uh, generally, you're not going to see the name of NISC on, on a big billboard or anything like that because we are very much facilitators. We are very much behind the scenes. We provide the in infrastructure, the accounting, the billing, um, the engineering, the payment services, all of that, the education, the networks. Um, we do that to facilitate the work of the rural electrics and rural telephones, which is basically bridging that, that technical divide from the big cities to 85% of the landmass, which is considered rural and in most cases not, not technically feasible or economically viable to deliver those services. And, and so we had a small piece of making sure that would happen. And um, I think for those directors that started that co-op, you know, to see what it has begun, become, to see the scope of it um, all across the United States and all 50 states has been been pretty neat. So I feel that I've had such a great opportunity because I've been able to work in the amazing field of technology. I've been able to work in that field in a cooperative environment where I could go to work every day feeling good about the fact that we were taking care of our employees, we were taking care and protecting our member owners. And oh, by the way, work in a field that was fascinating and fast moving and, and an opportunity for me to work with, and I know I'm biased, but some of the most brilliant technicians that you're ever gonna find. So that's the cooperative story, and, and I'm here to tell you that if it would have not been for that cooperative business model, that mission, we could not have delivered on the mission. You know, NISC would get phone calls, a couple phone calls a month from venture capitalists saying, you know, we'd like to buy you. And I worked for a board of directors that believed in the cooperative business model and knew that it was more than money. It was about delivering critical services to rural America. And they never lost sight of that. And so for me, I just consider myself to be very lucky to be able to work within the confines of that business model and then be able to deliver on that, that mission that, uh, that we all believed in. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks, Bert. <laughs> all right. Andy. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, I, I think my story about um, why I do what I do uh, really comes down to a, a single individual. Um, I think a lot of us, or, or maybe some of you, um, have been sort of mentored, inspired, um, whatever, you know, led to, to do what you do because of a single individual. Um, for me, that was somebody who I met in graduate school, a guy named Don Turner, T-E-R-N-E-R. -E um, and uh, uh, Don um, was the founder of UEB, where I, where I work. Um, and Don had uh, uh, sort of this 
this notion. And he always talked about things as notions. I don't know where that word comes from um, or why he used it a lot, but he had this notion that um, when it came to affordable housing, um, that low-income people, people who lived in disinvested, abandoned communities, um, really wanted to rebuild their communities, that their communities were, were sort of whole um, in a place where they, they were born, where they lived their lives, where they were married, they had their jobs, children grew up. Um, and they weren't places to be urban renewed, to be bulldozed. And that if given the chance, uh, people uh, could and would and uh, should be able to uh, take part through self-help in rebuilding their communities. And so Don was the founder of, of UHAB and our original work was urban homesteading, people taking over abandoned buildings um, and using their own labor to fix it up. Um, there is a, a rumor that uh, the folks who led UHAB before I was there invented the word sweat equity um, to go along with this, which is may be true. Um, but I met Don when I was an architecture student, graduate school, and I was designing uh, shopping centers and other sorts of practice projects. And all of a sudden he gave a lecture about self-help housing, New York City, homesteading. Um, and I said, oh, that's what I really want to do. So I left architecture school, became a VISTA volunteer in the South Bronx, came back to, to architecture school, and there was Don, a professor, um, at, uh, at architecture. I worked with him. I studied with him. Um, we went to Sacramento and worked in the housing department for uh, Jerry Brown in his first uh, undertaking, always pushing the notion of, of self-help housing and cooperative housing. And then one day, um, the folks from UAB called up and looking for somebody to take a particular job. I said, I'll take that job, which was my only job interview I've ever had. <laughs> And the only response I ever gave was, I'll take that job. Um, <laughs> and anyway, so 40 whatever years later, um, I'm still doing that work. And I don't think without Don's inspiration, um, I, I would be doing what I'm doing. And I know, I don't know if Chuck is here and some others who uh, will be at the dinner tonight, but other folks who worked at UAB were similarly inspired by, by his ability to uh, have this vision and, and help us learn that vision. All right. so. Thanks, Clark. Uh, KZ, I'll dispense with, with Karen. Yeah. Just... <laughs> Thank you, Doug. Uh, my co-op journey um, doesn't have the allure, I think, of all these other stories, but maybe that's what it's like to hear other stories. Um, I started out in graduate school in environmental education. And uh, so the education part of it was uh, appealing to me, but I, um, I felt like I, was, I had more bad messages to deliver than good positive messages. And so that, um, that led me to looking for something that wasn't narrowly in the field of environmental education. And I happened to cross um, a, an advertisement for a, for a VISTA volunteer. Looks, looks like we got a little thread there. Um, so I served as a VISTA volunteer for a year, uh, working to s help start the Michigan Alliance of Co-ops. Mm. And my project focus was on educational resources um, to for co-ops and about co-ops. Mm. And uh, um, as a part of that project, I would travel around the state and meet with different groups, and I got an invitation at one point um, to go make a presentation to the Education Committee of Co-op Services, Inc., uh, the senior citizen housing co-op that still, yes, still, thank you, I got aff affirmation, still <laughs> operates out of the Detroit area. Um, the Education Committee, right? It's in November, I'm gonna talk about how co-ops contribute to the Thanksgiving table. I show up and there are 200 people at the Education Committee of the Co-op Services, Inc. And I'm, you know, this 20-year-old co-op, uh, you know, enthusiast and uh, it was pretty astounding to me. And um, so uh, after my presentation, uh, probably three or four people came up and wanted to shake my hand and tell me how exciting it was to see young people involved in co-ops. Um, 
so that that was like the hook. Uh, I was sold <laughs> after that. Um, and uh, from there, I started working at NASCO uh, with Jim Jones and uh, many other co-op stars. Um, worked with NCBA for a spell out of their little satellite office in uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan, until that needed to get closed down and moved and worked with uh, North Coast Co-op, uh, became a consultant, uh, worked on different projects for ACE, Association of Co-op Educators, and for a lot of different co-ops, helped found a group called CGIN. A lot of acronyms, I'm sorry. Uh, co-op Grocers Information Network, and, and then worked with regional co-op associations, food co-op associations, grocery co-op associations, that eventually rolled up and uh, formed NCG. But the through line for me was always co-op. It was never about the food. It was never about organic or natural products. Those are fine things in my view. I was drawn to that based on my interest in environmental impact, but, uh, but the through line for me was co-op and I really wanted to, I saw the opportunity of co-op making a difference in the world in a way that was positive. I could build something and that mm. was exciting for me. Yeah. That's great, that's great. <laughs> And and Casey, I'll put you on, on notice that I'm gonna go I'm gonna go opposite way for oh, this next okay. question. So you so oh. you're gonna go first, and it's gonna be around leadership <laughs> quality. But I do I just want to make a quick observation. Those of you who who've been participating in the in the conference this week know that the theme is around embracing our cooperative identity, um, and it 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 just really strikes me how these individuals um, have at their core um, the 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 shared values and the principles of co-ops and I just it just keeps ringing around my head so we might come back around to that but but we can talk about leadership a little bit um, fantastic set of heroes and leaders uh, Casey can you share uh, what types of leadership qualities you think are most important for cooperative leaders and if you want you know connected to in general like what what are those that really really make an impact um, well, I don't know that I have any really big secrets uh, anyway, but I, I think it boils down to a clear vision and um, really having, giving people a sense of inspiration, which is readily available to us in the co-op business model. Mm -hmm. It's there in the values, it's there in the principles, and um, all we need to do is help people understand that, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, in my experience, uh, People aren't always excited about a little lesson on what a co-op is or co-op values, but once you once you can get them past that initial um, "do I have to" <laughs> uh, moment, that they find it very inspiring, mm -hmm. and that that is what really um, inspires people to be part of something, right. and that's really important. <coughs> One other little thing I'll say is um, a. Very, a wise person taught me that as part of groups, because we're all part of a lot of groups and meetings here in co-ops, right, uh, that the principle of yes and is um, mm -hmm. very important mm -hmm. uh, to lead with, I'm listening, and I wanna add something to the thought, not yes but, you know, but a uh, little tiny notion, but yeah. it, a powerful it's an important one. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's great, and uh, on that theme of building, again, yeah. that you want to build something, yeah, and not necessarily compete. Andy, talk about your leadership observations. Um, I think for, I, I would agree with the vision. I mean, we have always done well in our co-op creation and organizing and so forth when we have a group of people, in particular leaders who have a vision and mm -hmm. can share that vision. Um, but I, I also think that um, the success of our co-ops um, has to do with, with participation, which is really a difficult thing in co-ops and mm -hmm. getting people to remember that they're a co-op and, and all those sorts of things. But on the other side of, of that is, is the sense that people get um, when they participate, um, when they're able to, to sort of take control of a piece of their life and make real decisions that have real consequences around that, and and to you know, you know, enjoy either the benefits 
or even suffer the consequences mm -hmm. of a not so good decision. Mm -hmm. And um, I strongly believe, and we strongly, uh, as, and you have as in our staff, in working with co-op leaders, um, is both um, encouraging them to get their members to have the opportunity to sort of taste that mm -hmm. that uh, 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 power. Mm -hmm. it, it's almost like dealing drugs in a way. Give them a taste, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and they'll come back for more. And it's amazing to see what people do with that mm -hmm. uh, once they've, they've felt that, and what they do with it in other parts of their right. lives. In other part of my life, I, I have done community gardening, and it was pretty interesting to you know, have co-ops in a neighborhood, and then one day be out there with the green gorillas, and working in a garden and it's like all the same people mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, and I think once they uh, um, you know get that taste they're out there and they're participating um, I would say one other thing that's true when I used to go and do calling or, or campaigning for some of our local electeds um, when you look at the lists um, that they would give you of who to call who their dependable voters were yeah. Um, in our neighborhood, they were all the co-ops, right. mm -hmm. um, of which there are thousands in my neighborhood. But right. but it's co-op members that that participate. So yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And it reminds me of the the observation from Jessica Gordon Emhart in Collective Courage that many of many of the civil rights leaders, if you look at their bio, um, right. many of them cut their teeth on doing co-op organization in the 30s and 40s, mm -hmm. actually. And like you say, once you you can't unlearn that 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 power of organization participation. Vern, you're, you're, I'll, I'll mention to Vern before as you lead up, I, I might have a sense what you're gonna say because one of, another book that I have on my shelf and that I go back to besides Collective Courage is, is Vern's book on, on service leadership. And um, it, it, it was one of the early books that I read when I got into this job and it continues to affect. So I'm looking forward to hearing what you say about leadership, Vern. Well, thanks, Doug. And, it's interesting that this would really be the first question that you ask, mm -hmm. uh, because I, I believe that um, leadership is a way for co-ops to distinguish themselves from other business models. Uh, if, if you would ask me uh, in my career in watching NISC grow to what it became, there's a lots of metrics that we could use <clears throat> that may indicate success and leadership, whether it's the number of co-ops that we served or the number of employees that we grew to, or revenue, or research and development, and all that. But I would say to you that in, in my employment at NISC, my greatest accomplishment, my greatest accomplishment was the development of the management team that we had, the vice president group. It was a group of nine individuals, and four of them are in this room today that absolutely epitomized what we were trying to do as a cooperative. I mean, it wasn't about bits and bytes and operating system and cloud and all of that. It was about leadership because there was no way that we could go out and compete with the SAPs, Oracles, the big technical companies on wages or benefits or, I mean, you know, NISC didn't have $200 billion in the bank. I don't know, maybe you do since I left now. <laughs> but the, the point is this, I mean, we led with culture, we led with leadership. We said to these technical people that had options to go elsewhere, we want you to work here. This is a place you can believe in. You, you can trust management, and, and we didn't get it right all the time. I mean, there were a plenty, plenty of mistakes that we made along the way. But, I mean, we got to the place where the mantra was for promoting anybody in the organization. If service is beneath you, leadership is beyond you. If you don't believe that serving our members and serving the employees that you supervise is your priority, then I don't think you fit into the culture here. And, and we passed on a lot of really good, smart people, but I wouldn't trade any of them for the leadership team that is in place today based on that question. All right, thanks. Clark. 
Oh, yeah, excellent question. Um, and I really um, appreciate everything that's been contributed. You know, I come, I come to cooperatives, and, and it's cooperatives with the little C, not the, the big C, per se. Um, although, as a lawyer, technically, um, I think I probably understand subchapter T and, you know, <laughs> other aspects of uh, organizing and operating a cooperative as, as anybody else. But, um, but I also see cooperation as being sort of the main, um, the main focus. And, and I'm also, you know, again, I'm a technician, so I'm not per se in the leadership role. I'm more of a foot soldier. I'm more of, you know, captain, take that hill. So I take the hill. Um, <laughs> and that hill may be, how do we raise money? Um, how do we have a diversified board? What I find, I mean, in the leaders that I've, I've worked with, um, I think being able to, to teach, being able to train, being able to communicate, are just extremely uh, valuable uh, characteristics. I think once people understand um, that their values or that they can operate business-wise, they can operate in the product production world with values mm -hmm. that are consistent with their religious, their moral principles, that, that that's the driving force. That's what creates businesses and organizations that. Uh, that mean something, that, 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 have a, that have a significance in how we do things. And so I first I would look at uh, probably Julius Nyeri, um, the president of, uh, first president, founder of, of, of Tanzania, um, who built an economy around cooperatives, um, a cooperative economy. Um, he was also a teacher. I look at um, uh, Steve Dawson, at the ICA, very patient, uh, very focused on, on creating uh, collective decision making based on values. Um, I look at my friend uh, Ed Whitfield. He doesn't consider himself a leader per se because he's a priest king and priest kings aren't leaders. They're, they're value protectors, value teachers. And uh, um, when, when folk are looking to make decisions, uh, Ed is often called upon to to bring in the value-based aspects of, of decision making, um, but then again, you know, you can look at um, Cooperative Fund of New England. Uh, Rebecca Dunn. Um, Rebecca was not necessarily a great teacher, as much as she was um, uh, <clears throat> a hard worker, tenacious, uh, um <clears throat> energetic, and creating space for people to operate collectively. Hmm. Um, I look at my current uh, uh, boss, <laughs> my daughter's favorite uncle, um, uh, Brendan Martin, um, great teacher, great teacher. Um, and, um, and C. Commons is, uh, you know, is going from, you know, very, uh, you know, a, a, a spot on the map to, to now a, a real location. Um, and I could cite others, um, Charles Prejean, uh, Rose Sanders um, created a lot of space. Great teacher, great teacher. Um, and um, so I think it's about teaching, understanding values, and, um, and creating space for people to then make those decisions. Some of you may have known Frank Adams, Chuck Turner. I mean, great teachers. Wouldn't necessarily say they were leaders, leaders, but in terms of creating the cooperative, being able to articulate values and understand that values can be part of a business model, um, I think is extremely important. And of course, having said that, I've got to also uh, close by just saying, uh, I think I was part of one of the greatest business value-based uh, uh, organizations, uh, Equal Exchange, um, that's ever been organized. Um, and um, the leaders at Equal Exchange basically created space, held everybody's uh, uh, decision-making accountable to values, and, and, and extended that as far as they possibly could. Um, Eagle Exchange was founded by sisters, um, Adrian Dominicans, sisters of St. Joseph, sisters of St. Mary's, who wanted to reflect their investments 
as being consistent with their religious principles. And so that, that infectious sort of connection of capital to a business mm -hmm. and the business being equal exchange would then say, we're only gonna do business with people who share these values, began to build a, a community of, 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 of cooperative uh, and, and socially responsive, sustainable, um, <clears throat> sustainable enterprises. So um, again, I think it's about instilling and teaching the values, and it's about creating space for people to make those decisions. That's a great answer. That's great. Thank you, Clark. Um, so this next one's a jump ball, so whoever wants to grab it. Um, uh, you know, 2021, uh, this last 20 months, we've all lived through, um, you know, a, a, a crucible of, of change. Uh, public health, racial equity, uh, greater focus on environmental sustainability and climate, uh, even the, the, the changing nature of work. You know, those who, uh, who got to stay at their desks or stay at their home, and those who couldn't, um, which were way, way more overrepresented by, by black and brown people. Uh, so we're, you know, we're in the middle of, of, of a changing time. Um, and we need to think about what to, what's cooperative's role. You know, what, what, what does it all mean? Uh, how can cooperatives, you know, play a bigger role uh, given the, the dynamics where we find ourselves today? Um, and I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. You know, it's, we're in a different place than we were three years ago. Um, what does it mean as, as the cooperative community? What do we need to be thinking about in the next five years? Jump ball, easy one. <laughs> You're here. You know, I think for, for our, <laughs> our business and our members, um, we always understood the importance of, I'll, I'll, I'll pick the service of broadband. We understood that that was really important and there was a huge initiative to deploy broadband in the rural areas. We didn't understand, you know, prior to the pandemic, we didn't fully understand how impactful that was, how in a matter of a couple weeks, we switched from a in the office to a virtual economy. We switched from an in the classroom to a virtual classroom. And all of that was facilitated by broadband. And so I remember a book that NRECA commissioned years ago called The Next Greatest Thing, mm -hmm. meaning bringing electricity to rural areas. But the conversation now within that rural electric, rural telephone community is the next greatest thing is broadband. Mm -hmm. And the responsibility that we have um, to bring broadband to those underserved areas. And you know, so many times that cooperative business model fits very well in that scenario where maybe it isn't the best financial proposition or investment to do it. We understand the responsibility to make sure that all those people are served. And so, you know, we're, we're seeing this groundswell of uh, not only telephone cooperatives, but electric cooperatives realizing that if they don't do it, no one else will. If they don't bring those services, those people will go unserved, and that's not acceptable. So that has been um, such a rallying cry for the cooperatives that NISC serves, and quite frankly, for the employees of NISC to understand the role that they're playing in making sure that that happens. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, to know that that cooperative business model once again is facilitating the deployment of what some said was gonna be impossible to mm -hmm. do is very motivating. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that um, you, had, you had mentioned before that you know, many of the civil rights leaders sort of mm -hmm. cut their teeth in, in co-ops. And, and I think if you think about uh, many of the other, um, you know, the, the um, labor unions and, and their mm -hmm. tie to cooperatives yeah. and, the, and bringing food, um, I think about the, in New York City, we had something called the uh, Consumer Farmer Foundation, which was a mm -hmm. dairy 
cooperative, but it was a cooperative of upstate dairy farmers and downstate uh, low-income consumers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, because you couldn't get fresh milk in, in New York. Um, and so uh, um, I, I think that co-ops have been in these, these um, issues before. Mm -hmm. I think they've been in protecting workers' rights. I think they've uh, been in certainly the values of, of democracy and equity and equality and, mm -hmm. and all these sorts of things are, are, are and, and these are things that are in the history. Um, so I think it is, it is a tool um, I think the model is, is sort of right. I think the time is right. Mm -hmm. And the issues are there, you know, mm -hmm. the, the racial justice and climate and all of those. And I, I, just, I, I just hope um, that the uh, um, co-op model can sort of get pushed to be right. one of the tools cause, um, and we can get from talking about it and making a little progress to actually taking advantage of this moment. Yeah, yeah, um, that's good, that's well said, Andy. I don't know, Clark or KZ? Um, <clears throat> well, I think uh, pretty grounded in the world of grocery co-ops, I would say that our grocery co-ops have proven that they stepped up, you know, mm -hmm. in some really challenging times. Uh, um, you know, having to adapt their operations, ha having to figure out how to stay open and serve people without <laughs> serving as super spreader uh, locations and, uh, you know, just all of that kind of thing. Uh, even sourcing food and, um, you know, in, it, especially last March, at March and April of 2020, at, there were some rough patches there. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, that that uh, our co-ops really um, took advantage of the business model mm -hmm. to say this is who we are. Mm -hmm. We don't just say we'll close the doors until we figure it out. We have to keep um, serving the people who, you know, our ownership base. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, um, and I think that, um, that that's the challenge to us all mm -hmm. as co-op leaders is to keep looking at that, at our co-op DNA mm -hmm. and saying what does it challenge us to do? What are we, what are the times asking and demanding of us as co-ops today? Yeah, yeah, that's great. It, it makes me think, KZ, um, many of you probably know KZ is, uh, serves on, on the board of NCBA Inclusive, so she's, she's one of my bosses. Um, and she's on the executive committee, so she's like really one of my bosses these days. Uh, and Watch out, Doug. The, the, the first sort of long uh, extended conversation I remember having with KZ, we were sitting on a bus in, I think it was Columbus. Um, we were there for our June board meeting and we were visiting Columbus and, and, and spending some time at, at Nationwide and in the archives of Murray Lincoln and um, looking at the history of, of uh, you know, that, that storied part of our cooperative movement. Uh, and and we were talking. I was reading some of these books when I was kind of started in Burns' book and, and others. And um, and KZ said uh, the phrase. She said, "Yeah, cooperatives are solution machines. Uh, they're you know they're they're it, it's a tool that people use that that otherwise wouldn't be available. You know that they're working together. Um, so I just I, I I didn't mean to interject. And Clark, I want you to comment on on co-ops." in this moment, but, you know, as a solution machine, what, what can they solve, you know, that, that's been laid bare? It's what can we solve and yeah. how do we solve it? What's the forum for solving problems? Um, I would say two things. If you're saying in the next five years, um, and you're gonna, you guys are going to say, well, you already know I'm crazy, so I don't have to <laughs> <laughs> justify myself. But I would say, uh, one, um, Promote the empowerment of black female leadership. Um, and I'm inspired in somewhat by <laughs> Carol Zippert, mm -hmm. who's a member of this mm -hmm. cherished hall. Mm -hmm. In her speech, she basically said, well, I was doing cooperatives. I didn't even know it. It's just, <laughs> that's my nature. Mm -hmm. And I think... You know, and I look at my wife, my wife is sitting back there, hope you get a chance to meet her, she's from Zanzibar. Um, I think almost inherent, and it's just, I guess, a village life, whatever, that there may be sort of a genetic piece in black women 
that mm. says cooperate. <laughs> uh, and it's, I mean, we, my, my wife, when she fix, she can take a, a piece of meat that, you know, normally would, I'd eat three of them. And she'll use that one piece of meat and fix a meal for 10 people. And that's about cooperation. And that's about making sure everybody's being considered. So there, there's some women out there, and I just think we're in this era where let's promote, let's support the Stacey Abrams, the Stacey Adams, mm -hmm. the, the Latasha Browns, the uh, uh, Dara Coopers, the Katrina Baxters, uh, uh, the women who are out there, the Kamala Harris's. Let's give black women a, an opportunity. And, and let's not neglect white women. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> But with its age, I think, promote womanhood. And we've been, we've been in power a long time here. You guys, you know, we've, mm -hmm. we've had some, our privileges, even as a black man. You know, black men were voted before white women. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? I mean, but anyway, so I say uh, promote, promote womanhood. And then I would also say direct as much capital as we possibly can direct to the, cap, to the cooperative movement. Mm -hmm. Um, I know of several, oh, right on. Mm -hmm. I know uh, at Seed Another Commons, mm -hmm. we now have 30 local community development finance groups. And I was on a call, the last call I was on with all of the, the peers, we call them peers. Boy, the projects they were talking about were just amazing. Mm -hmm. Solar, I mean, I mean just, just some really interesting and this is all across the country. And this is at the grassroots level. So this is not like the Ford Foundation or Rockefeller saying we've got a strategy to do this. This is somebody in a neighborhood saying we can use a, a dry cleaner or a laundry or um, we can make certain things. And, and we're prepared to support it and we've got the capital from the mothership Seed Commons. And at the local level, we've got the technical assistance. So as much capital as we can get into the arena of cooperative economic development, I say that's very positive. Mm -hmm. Ed Whitfield, I hate to bring up Ed, but Ed's one of my, one of my heroes. Um, project we're working on in, in Los Angeles, uh, downtown Crenshaw uh, rising. Ed's raised about 30, helped raise about $30 million mm -hmm. in equity to purchase a, a, a mall. I mean, we were sort of still struggling with it. But the, the, the whole focus of purchasing this mall, it's 40 acres in central LA, was to create an urban village. And it was gonna to be totally, and it's gonna to be totally cooperative. That they're actually gonna put covenants in the deed of the, of the property that they've got a land trust. This is, you cannot lease land, you cannot operate an, an organization on this, in this village unless you have cooperative principles and embedded into your organizational structure. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying there is a lot going on. Mm -hmm. We need more capital to develop them, develop these organizations and develop these ventures. So empower black women and channel money to, to cooperative economic development. That's what I say. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> awesome. That's very good. Thank you. Thanks, Clark. Um, the, uh, the next question, I, I'm, I actually I want to go back a little bit. Um, we're, we're with leaders and, and heroes. And this is one of the reasons why I think this conversation every year is so uh, interesting is that, um, that, that generally you're celebrating a, a bunch of people who, as leaders, um, who believe in service. You know, who there's, there's that tension of, in, in the cooperative uh, community of, uh, you know, we, we need to develop that, that next generation. Um, we need to focus on, on communities that have been, that have been shut out uh, in the past. Uh, and, and at the same time, you know, how do, you, how do we create that culture so it doesn't celebrate the individual necessarily, you know, but, um, but you create a path for them to make that type of impact so that they get into those positions, you know, of, of change. This is, in, in the, for me, the, the sort of paradox or, or these people that we're sitting with right here. They, 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 they got into this to serve their members, to serve the communities, um, and, and they sort of, they, 
maybe they tumbled up into it. Uh, is that, the, is that yeah. the only way we do it? How do we create those paths um, so that you know, 20 years from now, when, when you know, some of us that are, that are here will be sitting here watching this and there's going to be a set of folks, how did they get on that path? Is that an open, open enough question? <laughs> That's a pretty open question. I, 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 I'm not exactly sure what you're, what you're asking, but one of the things that... It doesn't I, matter. Just go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Wisdom. Well, I'm not either. <laughs> right. Well, one, of the, one of the things that, that I, I notice, and I look out here, although we're sort of blinded yeah. by the lights, um, but, but this is not a young audience yeah. that, we're, that we're talking to. And... And for many years, um, coming to these, which I do um, every year when I can, and other co-op meetings, it, it's not a young audience. So I think the right question is, you know, how do we make room, and and are mm -hmm. we occupying our chairs too long? Mm -hmm. And uh, on the other hand, putting more capital into the co-op movement would, you know, help make it much bigger and stronger and mm -hmm. a lot more room as well. But but I really, I don't think I have an answer, but it really yeah. worries me yeah. um, about where are the, uh, the younger generations in this movement. Although, um, if you go to a NASCO meeting, um, you'll see an awful lot of them. Um, but whether they make it into the co-op movement um, as we know it, I, I don't know, or whether we're making room um, in the organization. Yeah. So, so it is something that, that I think we really have to be concerned about. But, but I really also think that there is a, uh, a real interest that I've heard all around the country um, of people of doing co-ops, mm -hmm. um, of building um, and rebuilding and fixing what's wrong with the co-op model. Yeah. And so I think it's our opportunity. Um, I don't know if I have an answer. But yeah. it, it well, is. I think that I, to me that, that that's, a, that's a really important answer. And I get to see a lot of different sectors and, you know, uh, used to go to a lot of places, now I get to see a lot. And I, my observation is that, um, is that more and more younger people are interested. Um, many really talented people. Um, the, some of the most interesting ones are they, they came to co-ops, maybe they had a bit of a career before and they come to it when they're 30 years old or something like that. And they think they're the ones that discovered co-ops, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's that's that's. Uh, um, but uh, but I think you know I think your observation. Uh, I I noticed after our advocacy panel um, this afternoon, we had a panel on on you know cooperating in action through advocacy. And we had three wonderful folks, um, and uh, uh, as they walked off, I looked and, and we didn't do it. We we, we didn't design this uh, on purpose. But they were all, I don't know how old they were all, they were all relatively young, I'll put it that way. And, and it wasn't, they were not chosen as great advocacy voices because they were young, it's because they were great advocacy voices, um, which was a really heartening moment, you know, so I think we do have to, to capture those. But Casey. Well, the one other thing that I would add is, at least from reflecting from my own experience, um, you know, where I saw a pathway from, from the various interests that led me to co-ops, you know, from environmental concerns, from uh, interest in natural foods. But I saw a pathway to thinking about co-op as the most important element to pursue. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, just figuring out how we encourage people that they can see that pathway. No, uh, very few, I think, people come to a career in co-ops to do co-op, they right. come here to be a, they start out as an architect, or they right. start out with IT, or they start right. out as a lawyer, and they start out, um, you know, doing other things, and they find the co-op business model, and that becomes the path, and I think that's, that, you know, figuring out how to transition into that pathway is part of the secret. I don't right. know that it, I have the answer. Right, but. right, but it's really communicating the co-op identity of itself, yeah, is such an important A bigger thing. world, too, yeah. making. Right, yeah, Vern, Clark. I, I think the, you know, part of the realities we face is the cooperative business model is not something that is discussed a lot in, in universities right. or colleges. Now, there's some great examples around the country of where it is, but the majority is not. And I think as, 
as cooperative leaders, it's important for us to make sure our organizations are examples of how co-ops are different. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I look at NISC, the majority of the new hires that come into that organization, a couple hundred every year, um, are going to be individuals that come right out of the university, and their first exposure to co-ops is their employer. Right. And, and so when we talk to them about what it means to be a cooperative in a technical space, which, you know, typically you don't think about co-ops in that space, um, that makes all the difference, and they're watching. I mean, I, they uh, very much are watching and trying to figure out, maybe you could even say they come into the organization with a bit of a chip on their shoulder because of the bad behavior they see in corporate America, mm -hmm. and they really want to know if what we say, when we talk about co-op values and mm -hmm. things like that, mm -hmm. if it's real, mm -hmm. if it's real. Yeah. I think one of the, <clears throat> the nicest compliments I got about selecting co-ops as a career um, came from one of our sons who had gotten a degree in finance and was working in, in big uh, commercial banks as a commercial bank loan officer, did that for quite a few years, had a chance to come over and to work for a credit union. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a little surprised and worked in that arena for a couple of months and I was talking to him and he said, you know, Dad, I finally get it. Mm -hmm. He said, all these years, You'd come home, and maybe I was a little overzealous. I can't imagine that. <laughs> you know, it was co-op this and co-op that, and um, you know, and here he was working for the dark side, and <laughs> and, um, and he said, "I get it. You know, I, I get it. We. It isn't just about making a few rich people richer. It's about taking care of your employees. It's about taking care of your customers. I get it, and that's the place that we have to." to get with these young people is so that they get it. And I'll tell you, they are more open to that mm -hmm. today. I agree with you, Doug. Mm -hmm. They are more open to that notion today than certainly my generation when we jumped in the mm -hmm. workforce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Yeah, I would say um, it's definitely we gotta support the young folk. And, um, and the young folk, what I find, their agenda is much broader than cooperatives. They're interested, they're into climate, they're mm -hmm. into gender, they're into sexual preference, they're into sustainability. I mean, they, they have, and they talk more about solidarity economy, uh, economic solidarity, um, you know, social impact, um, wealth gap. Cooperative Fund of New England, um, which started off very conservative uh, as a cooperative fund of New England. <laughs> um, they changed their identity, we changed our identity, to being a social change organization that's using cooperation and financing of worker-owned enterprises as a way to address mm -hmm. racial inequality and social justice. And so I'm just simply saying, and I, I work, I, I'm very privileged. I mean, one of my proudest um, achievements is that I work with a group of young lawyers. I, I, I support them as much as I possibly can. And um, I, they're, just, they're all brilliant. But their agenda is much broader than just cooperatives. Mm -hmm. Cooperatives is part of that arsenal. But, um, and there are a couple, I mean, I hope you get to meet uh, uh, Jeff Gilbert. Uh, he should be here. Uh, Julian, um, Julian Hill, I mean, these guys are, you know, Sarah Kaplan, Darkus uh, Gilmore, uh, Renee Hatcher up in Chicago. Um, and they're, they're looking at economy um, much broader. They're looking at social justice much broader. Um, but cooperative is their business entity form. Mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. That's their primary, uh, primary focus, but it's about these other issues. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I think he, all of us can grab some, some young folk and take them under our wing and make sure they're getting information, make sure they're getting notices of various opportunities um, and, and, and being supported. We also should go out of our way to support some of these young enterprises because the, the, the young emerging entrepreneurial enterprises, they're staffed by young people. 
you know, the solar company, the grocery store, the bicycle repair shop. I mean, these are, these are young folk who are, you know, the, the, the garden. Um, go out of our way. It may cost a little bit more. Um, it may not be exactly what we want. But go out of our way to support these folk. Um, because that's, that's where our future lies, mm -hmm. uh, with our young folk and, and how much we can nurture and, and, and help develop them. So, yeah, I mean, I, I have my cadre. I hope everybody has a, mm -hmm. a cadre of young folk that they're going out of their way. And with my young folk, I say, oh, yeah, I'm supporting them. But I, I'm so privileged to, have, to be able to work with them because I learn so much right. from them. Um, as I give and I, I lay, you know, trans, transfer, you know, my knowledge and my experience. But um, yeah, it support the young folk. That's great. Yeah, that's great, Clark. Um, I think we're we're at a good time for for the last question, and um, and and you can keep it fairly short if you like. And uh, with with all recognition to Ladonna Redmond Sanders, yesterday I watched the. There was a, a great, and it's on, it's on demand on the impact uh, with the invisible impact of women in cooperatives. And, um, and LaDonna asked the question. Uh, she was moderating the panel of, of these wonderful women cooperators. Uh, she asked the last question. I'm going to use it. Uh, so you, you're, um, you have an opportunity to give advice to your younger self. You know, maybe that, maybe that younger self is 20 years old or so. Um, what would, what would that key piece of advice be um, now that you got a little more context? Mm -hmm. and, it, and, and by the way, this person who's 20, this isn't just like a, a generic person. This is your younger self. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get personal here. <laughs> Jump ball. They didn't know this was coming, by the way. <laughs> so can I give it a try? Go, go for it, Bert. You know, I'll, I'll try to give you an example that's very contemporary. And I'll start with my advice. My advice is be true to yourself no matter what the temptations are. So big tech in the news quite a bit. A lot of times not very positively. You've just seen. Um, you know, testimony on behalf of Facebook and how they use data. I think all of the, the whole business model of the Googles and the Facebook and a lot of social media is based on data that every one of you sometimes unknowingly commit. And I, that's an asset for them and they monetize it. And there's huge rewards for doing that. So how would a co-op handle that? Mm -hmm. How would a co-op handle that? And I go back to uh, probably 1990 when the grid started becoming smarter and we had smart meters and we were accumulating all of this data off of the meters that are on all of our houses to the point where your utility can determine uh, what your consumption is in 15 minute increments. Uh, they know your paying habits, they know how you pay your bills. All of that is data that is in these monolithic databases. Very, very valuable. Back in the 90s, as that began, NISC as a cooperative made a decision that they were going to build a cooperative database that was going to own this data, and they would control how the data was used. So one of the first applications of the data was, maybe we should use that data to tell the end, consum end consumer how they're consuming electricity, not just this much a month, but this much a day or an hour, so that they could better understand how to be better consumers of electricity. But we knew that if we presented that data to them, that it would hurt the sales. The studies showed that once the consumer had that data, their consumption of electricity would go down by 10%. Who would do that? These co-ops are in the business of selling electricity. It's how they generate their margins. No, they're in the business of serving the member. Mm -hmm. And serving the member meant if we have this technology that can better educate them to consume less, even though their bills go down, that's what we're in business to do. And that's what was done. 
And, and today, most every co-op in the country makes that information available to their members. It's using the data in the very best way. And I'll tell you that has an impact on the employees of NISC because the employees of NISC talk to their tech buddies in other industries and it's like, do you know that that data is very valuable? Mm -hmm. Do you know that mm -hmm. every HVAC company and every solar company and all of these window companies, everybody would love to get their hands on that data so they could target the marketing of their products. And as a co-op, we say, no, that's not what we do. There's probably tens, millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars that that data is not monetized, but that would be untrue to our cooperative principles of taking care of protecting our members. Mm -hmm. And so if there's a, mm -hmm. a contemporary example of the difference between an organization that is charged with monetizing everything they can to increase shareholder wealth versus protect the consumer and make sure that we're taking care of them and, and we're protecting their pocketbooks also. That's what we do. For us, that became an example mm -hmm. of, of how we showed our employees the difference, mm -hmm. um, that we weren't going to sell data that wasn't ours. Right. And that's exactly what's happening right. today. So right. be, true, be true to yourself yep. or be true to the, to the value and the mission, or to the mission. Yep. That's great. That's an awesome example. Thank you, Vern. I would uh, jump in with, I guess something, I guess it's a little similar. Um, I, I remember uh, learning from uh, Don Turner the, um, when, I, when I actually was in graduate school in his, in his classes, um, ha having him talk about um, you know, working with a, a group of homesteaders, as we called them, who were taking over their building and gonna do this and gonna do that and putting together the loan and doing all these things and sort of marching down to the city on the day to sort of sign the loan and sign up for it um, and saying that when I turned around, there was nobody behind me. Mm -hmm. um, sort of, he got so engaged in doing the project, um, there hadn't been the education and bringing along the actual group who was going to do the project. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were gonna do it with their own labor, so mm -hmm. um, they truly were gonna do the project. Um, and, and that's a lesson that's, that's hard to remember mm -hmm. um, as you get excited in the, in the doing of the work um, is, is to remind yourself that one is, it's not your work, it's the co-op's oh. work. Right. Um, it's right. the co-op member's work, it's their co-op. And, and also to remember that, um, and something that we constantly have to remind our, ourselves in, in our work is that while we may believe in all of these principles and these, these sort of progressive um, you know, stances on, on how the world should work, not all of the people who live in the, in the co-ops that we work with um, have the same beliefs and, and you know, think about the same principles. And so without doing the hard work of understanding where people are and working with people so that they can advocate for those principles, for those kinds of things that will serve their co-ops, but just sort of going out and saying, we should do this. And I think one of the places where we've really struggled recently, although I think there's a lot of uh, strong winds coming against us on that, is about um, setting restrictions um, on, and, and setting sales prices on our affordable co-ops. And it has been something that we've been striving to do and striving to do, because we didn't do it in the beginning, because we were working with abandoned buildings that had zero value. Uh -huh. When you asked the bank to give you a loan, he said, right. but it's not worth anything. It's negative. Um, and so we weren't really worried about how much it's worth, but very soon value started coming. And now with gentrification right. and all the things that happened, the values are very high. So when we started asking, um, for restrictions, all of a sudden people realize that there's this enormous value. Right. That an apartment you might want to say should be sold for $85,000, yeah. um, you could sell it easily for a million and a half dollars. So you, you get into this problem of, yeah. of where people are. And so not doing, and, and so now we're in this, and, and we're really stuck in the middle of this yeah. in New York City. 
So not having done the education and the groundwork um, early on and consistently yeah. really, um, I think, is something that I, I guess I should have put a bigger sign up. <laughs> right. in my so that, that's a good piece of advice to yeah. younger self. Okay, yeah. thanks, Andy. Uh, I would say something similar. What came to mind when you asked the question is uh, that I would say to my younger self, trust the process, mm -hmm. because um, as someone who's really driven and really passionate about co-ops, it, right. um, it's hard to be patient sometimes. <laughs> You, um, you know what the end should be. Uh, when I got the answer, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, that's the advice that I would right. keep probably to my older self, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Casey. Clark. And I, I would, you know, I know this is not quite um, what you're looking for, but... Um, <laughs> you got the last word, so <laughs> go for it. <laughs> uh, but I, my, I, my 20 year old, I, I'd say to myself, um, Spend much more time, spend as much time as you possibly can with your, your daughter, your, mm. your, your new child. Um, and, and, and she turned out great. She's here, uh, Dr. Lauren Arrington. Mm. She's a PhD, uh, Duke University, nursing, catches babies, uh, <laughs> just a beautiful human being. But I didn't spend as much time with her as I should have, and I, I would have told myself. But I have the opportunity to, um, to reflect back or reflect forward because I now live with my youngest daughter, who's 16 years old, she's here, mm -hmm. um, Aini Alam Arrington. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to her doing as, uh, you know, as much damage as she can, uh, having as much fun and making a little bit of money. But she's, uh, you know, she's just, uh, and she's probably the youngest person here, to be about yeah, youth, yeah. but there's a 16-year-old mm -hmm. in the back. And she's um, all A's, uh, it's been her first, uh, you know, I guess 12 years in Africa, came here, English is a second language, um, but she's all A's, Cheltenham High School, Cheltenham uh, Township, um, took courses at Harvard this summer, University of Michigan, um, karate, swimming, basketball, <laughs> I mean, she's just, uh, and, her, and her main man is Brendan Martin. <laughs> so I'm, I'm having the time to spend with her, but I would have spent more time with my older daughter whose mother obviously took really good care of her, and she, <laughs> she's now uh, just uh, a special person. So, yeah, yeah. That's thank a you. Great, that's an excellent <laughs> All right. Well, I, th I think we'll, we'll, we'll have Clark uh, have the last word uh, on that with this, with this great uh, set of cooperative heroes. It, it, as, as always, and I think especially this year, as we've been able to get back together in person, um, it's been just a true pleasure and an honor to, to be with all of you. We, we look forward to many, most of us in the room tonight are going to be with you tonight for the induction ceremony and, and the celebration, and, and we just can't wait for that. So maybe one final round of applause for this, for this group of cooperative heroes. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I think, and JT, unless you, do you have a, a quick round of, of as JT comes to the, uh, well, j just a, a quick housekeeping, uh, and this is for those of you who are participating in Impact tomorrow, I just want to urge folks to arrive at about 8 o'clock in the morning, uh, because Secretary Vilsack uh, will be starting a conversation with Cornelius Blanding of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives, a board member for NCBA CLUSA at 8.30 sharp, um, and, uh, and that's gonna, that schedule's gonna be, be real tight. So I just wanted to emphasize that tomorrow morning. That's gonna be awesome. That'll also be live stream, but hopefully a number of you be, will, will be with us in person. But JT, other announcements? Uh, uh, what he said. <laughs> Uh, and that, that'll, that'll do it. So thank you so much, everyone, for, for being here this afternoon. Um, there is a, uh, at, for the Impact Conference, at 5 p.m., there is a book talk with Elias Krim. You can get that online. That's a live conversation as they talk about um, the Mondragon model and if that model can actually continue to be used today and what's the vision for that. Uh, so please join us there online at 5 p.m. And uh, have a great day. What a way to end the fourth day of Impact. So thank you again, everyone, for being here.